All right, Mr. Steve Lott, thank you very much for coming on to the BoxingBar.com, and welcome. Thank you. Steve, how did you get into the sport of boxing? How did boxing come into your life? Um, I was the, uh, I got into boxing in a very uh, unusual way. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I was playing handball, and uh, I became the national junior handball champion at the age of uh, 18, and the world champion was my coach. His name was Jim Jacobs. His company owned all the fight films in the world, and I thought that would be a cool place to work. So when I was 18, I asked him if I could start working at his company, Big Fights, in New York City, uh, working with the fight films. And as the years went by, uh, I became a film editor and got to love boxing, even though I never had heard of it or saw it or knew of it too much. And I became a film editor and uh, began producing films for uh, the company, for networks and HBO. And fortunately, at that time, the owners of the company, Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton, started managing fighters. And I asked them as the, for the role of assistant manager to go with the fighters to the fight site and be the camp coordinator, make sure everything went well from the minute the contract for the fight was signed to the moment they stepped in the ring so the managers can concentrate on the business and they didn't have to worry about the day-to-day uh, operations at the fight site. So that meant the, for the fighter travel, sparring partners, hotel, licensing, press conferences, interviews, anything and everything that the fighter would need. Early on, it was Wilfred Benitez and Edwin Rosario, two wonderful champions. And while the, the, the focus on the fight was big and there was a lot of attention, uh, it was good practice because in 1985, uh, Jim and Bill had a, you know, a training camp in upstate New York, and the uh, trainer up there, teacher, was a man named Customato, and his fighter was Mike Tyson. So I traveled with Mike Tyson. The practice of working with the camp and the fighters behind the scenes, it was very well, it's a great education because the pressure and the focus on Tyson was so enormous. Everything he did, everything he said, everything in the ring, out of the ring. But that was a fun time. So only because I played handball, that got me into boxing. Wow, and Jim Jacobs was a world-class player, if not the best player, considered to be the best player of handball in the world uh, at, at one point. Um, so, yeah, it, it is weird to hear you say that. I didn't know that, you know, you got into the sport there through him. Um, yeah. When you met Custom Auto for the first time, what was he like? What did you think of him? Well, it was an interesting meeting. It was at Jim Jacobs' apartment, probably around 1974. I had never met him before. And um, uh, he was in Jim's apartment. I was fixing the stereo system, uh, which is plugging some uh, wires, pretty simple stuff. And Cus was looking at me, and he said, um, oh, you're the new guy working with uh, Jim. I said, yeah. He said, well, you're, you know, you're pretty smart, and, you know, plugging all that stuff up. I said, no, it's pretty simple, Cus. Uh, he said, no, no, you're pretty smart. Uh, when were you born? That was, I thought that was a weird question. I said, January 17th. And he looked at me and said, uh, you're okay. <laughs> Not till years later did I find out he was born January 17th, and he was very into astrology. If you were of a certain birth date and you fell under a certain star, whatever that is, he was warped for you 100%. So for me, because my birthday was the same as his, and coincidentally the same as Muhammad Ali, January 17th, and the fact that Jim was very critical about people who worked with him and people around him, cuts right away uh, said in his mind, Steve, you're my friend. And that was a big plus for me because when Mike turned pro, he began living in my apartment with me. And Cus would never have permitted that if he didn't know my birthday and that I was working with Jim Jacobs. Jimmy, Jacobs, and Bill Kate, whether it be working with them or just being around them, what were they like? My role was film editor, and I would have loved to have been in the office more with them, the upstairs office, the business office. To listen, because when you have, it was like having uh, two computers, uh, you know, each of them running simultaneously, checking each other, and making sure that every equation, every period, every punctuation mark, everything was perfect. And when they got together, their minds were so incredibly pre- precise. Uh, in business, of course, locking up all the fight films in the world for the on the film side of it, and producing features that were nominated for Academy Awards. In 1969, 1970, legendary champions of Jack Johnson, uh, you know, licensing the footage around the world. You know, the, the film portion was incredibly brilliant. What they did with the fighters 
was more so because not only did they make incredible decisions for the fighters, but because they had a lot of funds at their disposal, they gave the fighters much more than they could ever get from anywhere else, which made the fighters more popular, which put the fighters in the public eye. And with the early fighters like Benitez and Rosario, uh, that was good. It really wasn't critical because they were already world champions on the way up. With Tyson, when Tyson got to the camp in 1980, it was an enormous expense for a 13-year-old kid who never had gloves on. Soon Mike was getting sparring partners up to the camp at $400, $500 a week, unheard of for an amateur, and eventually $1,000 a week, professional uh, contenders coming up there. So that and the marketing that was done with video and photographs, their knowledge of how to market the fighter, all of that together makes for a tremendous machine behind a fighter, or for that case, in any any uh, endeavor. Uh, so that was the brilliance that they had between the fight films and the boxing, that their minds. I'm trying to think of one decision they ever made that was not positive, that did not result in something positive for a fighter. And I, I just can't think of that. As opposite of that, you know, when Tyson was with King and Shelly Finkel, every decision resulted in something negative. I thought that was just shocking. And we talked about Cust and Jimmy and Bill, how you got to meet them. The first time you laid eyes on Mike Tyson, what was it like? Did you know there was something special there? Not only did I not know, but nobody on the planet knew there was anything special. Remember, when Mike lost in the finals of the uh, Olympic trials here in, in the United States, he lost a guy named Henry Tillman. He had some pizzazz coming up with Custom Motto and the legend of, of Patterson and Torres. But once he lost, he was history. He fought his first pro fight upstate New York for $400, and Jim and Bill actually had to pay him out of their own pocket because the opponent wanted so much money to go there. I met Mike for the first time only briefly in uh, 1984 in Catskill. I went up to watch him train. But the first time I actually hung out with him, he was supposed to turn pro in the fall of 84 after the Olympics, but he hurt his hand, and we had a, a sensational hand doctor in New York City so uh, the cops asked me, Steve, uh, you know, Mike has to come down for about 10 days to have this therapy on his hands. Can he stay with you? I said, terrific. Mike was a terrific kid. He slept on the couch. I slept in the bedroom, went to lunch, brought him to the office to watch films and edit the films. And after the, uh, I get a little uh, emotional, so hold on for one second. After the 10 days was up, uh, cops came down to the city to pick Mike up, and I brought Mike downstairs to the side street where Cus pulled up the car. And uh, I was just going to shake Mike's hand and say, hey, great to see you. Take care. He gave me this big hug that was so out of whack for me, for two guys to hug like that. But that was the way he was. He was such a tremendous, warm guy back then. And that told me that perhaps he'd be my friend, perhaps. So from then on, it was very, very comfortable for me to be around him because I knew, whatever the reason was, that he liked me. Perhaps because he knew Customato liked me and Jim Jacobs liked me. And from then on, it was great because every time he had a day off in between fights, he'd come and hang out at my apartment, sometimes completely unannounced. But remember now, nobody in the world at that time knew he was going to be anything, not the press. Not a promoter, not a manager. He's too short. He doesn't hit this way. He can't jab. The peekaboo style is no good. Only Customato and his brilliance knew that if Mike continued on, he'd be something incredibly sensational. Well, and it sounds like that hug was that first move of acceptance from Mike to you uh, at that point. Um, a lot of people talk about Tyson. His attitude or his behavior was bad. That trail back since he was a kid. Did you see any of that when you were around Mike Tyson? Or is that just taken to another level by media or whatnot? Well, I'm sure that when Mike was young in Brooklyn, he was a terror of, you know, horrible. And I'm sure that in Catskill early on, with Cuts, he was a terror early on. But Cuts knew. Cuts wasn't a kid. He had decades of experience with kids like that. And he knew that Mike, if given the right surroundings, would slowly learn to be a better person. Slowly learn, you didn't have to be a street thug. Now, 
there was a huge incident up there, of course, with uh, Teddy Atlas and Teddy's uh, a niece, and there was some uh, uh, improper actions. When Mike finally got to me, there was nothing that anyone could see that was a reflection of Mike from Brooklyn or from early days in Catskill. Cuts was so wise. There are some people who say that Mike was always very bad. And I, I remind them that when uh, Mike and Cuss and Teddy Atlas had this brouhaha in Catskill, uh, Teddy demanded that uh, Mike leave, that Mike be sent back to Brooklyn because he's no good. Cuss said to Teddy, look, I've been around kids a long time. What he did was horrible, but he'll get better. Believe me, I'm going to scold him. I'm going to admonish him, but he's going to get better. And Teddy Atlas said, no, he will not get better. Cuss said, look, is he, I, I have to let him stay here. That's when Teddy Atlas left the camp. Now, here's the, the line of demarcation. If Teddy was right that Mike was always going to be bad, well, it's odd because in 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, Mike became the world's most popular athlete, doing commercials on network television, a spokesperson for the New York City Police Department, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Drug Enforcement Administration from that period from 85 to 88. Now, usually, usually the New York City Police Department or the FBI, the DEA, they don't usually hire thugs to be a spokesperson. So if Mike had any problems at that, in that time period from 85 to 88, I think they would have dropped them. And the sponsors as well. Now remember, you know what, uh, Tiger Woods had a little incident with his wife and, and some uh, other woman. The, the sponsors dropped him so quick, it made your head spin. So did I ever see anything under that, in that way that was bad? No. And, remember, the pressure Mike was under as the youngest heavyweight champion of all time was enormous, enormous. And people would say, well, the pressure got there. Well, it didn't happen in 84, 85, 86, 87, 88. Well, Steve, it was, he was making too much money. Money always gets to these guys. He was sleeping on my couch, making millions of dollars a fight. Why didn't he have any problem in 84, 85, 86, 87, 88? They never have a response because they just didn't know the subject matter that well. But it did change dramatically in the summer of 88. They say, well, why? What happened? Bingo. Robin Givens and Don King. Before we get into all of that, from uh, the amateur days you were, you were speaking of, Mike Tyson, at what point did you guys know that it was time for him to go pro? Did he just have that style where you guys knew he was going to be suited better in the pros? Well, as a business decision, Cross, Bill, and Jim, we're hoping that Mike will go to the Olympics. Boxing has nothing to do with who the best fighter is. Amateur boxing, the only thing that matters is who's the best fighter. That's it. Professional boxing has nothing to do with that whatsoever. Professional boxing has nothing to do with who's the biggest fighter, the slowest fighter, the best fighter, the best champ. It has to do with who is the most biggest moneymaker. And Cus and Jim felt that an Olympic champion, heavyweight, turning pro, would be the biggest decision to make money in that direction. But after Mike lost in the finals of Olympic trials, there was no choice. He had to turn pro. There was no reason to keep Mike in the amateurs over and over and over when the right decision at that point was to turn pro. Now, looking back, it was a blessing in the sky that Mike did not win the trials and go to the Olympics because Mike had very few amateur fights, and he really wasn't develop emotionally to become a pro under the spotlight that the other Olympic kids had. Big, uh, Pernell Whitaker, Melchior Taylor, and that whole group from uh, 84. Mike needed a slow nurturing in those early fights in Albany and Troy to get him to where he could have a full wealth of emotional stability in that direction. It would not have been like that had he won the Olympics. So there was no choice. Mike had to turn pro right after the trials. In your observations, what was his relationship with Custom Auto? What were they like with each other during that time? Well, remember, I was never, ever in Catskill from 80 to 84 to see them interact in any way, never. And the only time I saw them really close was when Mike turned pro in uh, late 84 and he started hanging out with me. Then I would be with Cuss and Mike upon occasion. And for his first eight or so fights before Cuss passed away, I would be with Mike and Cuss at the same time. There was not a lot of communication between them at that time. And I believe that Cuss was very critical 
of Mike's uh, performances. Cuts was like a, a, a scientist. You had to do it in a very specific way, or else it's not going to work over and over and over and over. It'll be haphazard. And Cuts is the, the theory of the head motion, which no other trainer even knows or even recognizes in any way. Cuts knew that that was critical for Mike. And Mike, early on, I'm sure, was under so much pressure and emotionally was not stable enough to be able to do this. Cuts was probably pretty tough on him about that. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. So if that was the case, which I think it was, Cuss was not the type of guy to say that in public. He wouldn't say that to Mike around other people. He would say it once they're up in Catskill and once they're alone. He'd sit Mike down and say, look, Mike, here's the video. You're not moving your head. Uh, and that would have been the extent of the communications that I would have heard, anything like that um, uh, technical aspect of boxing. But I wasn't around him in those intimate moments. Tyson turns pro, fights, what was it, 13 fights before uh, Cuss passes, was knocking everybody out, was getting a whole lot of attention for such a young man, young heavyweight at that time. What was Mike's uh, mental state at that point right after Cuss model's death? Well, you know, Cuss was a brilliant guy. And uh, if, uh, if you're doing any endeavor and you're working with someone very close, if that moment the person passes away or leaves you, and you've been very close. It's a shock because you didn't expect that in any way, shape, or form. With Mike, Cus told Mike over and over, I'm not going to be around. I'm not going to be around. And Cus wanted to instill that in Mike so that when that happened, it would not be a shock to Mike. More than that, Cus said, okay, in his mind, how do I reinforce the fact I'm not going to be around? What, what would be a shock to Mike if I pass away? And he realized he didn't want to work the corner. Cus told Kevin Rooney, you're going to be in the corner, I'm going to be sitting down. And the reason for that, Kevin, is because if I start to work the corner, the first time I'm not up there, it's going to be a shock for Mike. But if you're working the corner, Kevin, over and over from the very beginning, and something happens to me, Mike won't see anything different in the corner. It'll be the same way. So Cuff's thinking process was way above what anyone could think about. He knew that the fighter had to be set in a certain direction, and he, Customato, did not want to be the guy to upset that. So that was the type of thinking around Mike and Cus. It was just, he was just brilliant. Also, in a way, he kind of set everything up beforehand. In other words, what was Kevin Rooney like? I mean, from that point on, pretty much Tyson had to rely on Kevin Rooney and Jimmy Jacobs and Bill Caton and you guys to be there for him at all times. Well, then again, in the same way that Mike probably looked at me and because I was uh, close with Cus and Cus knew me and close with Jim. Uh, Kevin, of course, had lived in the uh, house with them for a while, was up there in Catskill every day and trained up there every day and became, you know, was on the uh, cards that Mike fought on early on. Kevin was the headliner while he's still boxing and Mike fought on the other cards. They had a very close relationship. And Kevin was a very tough guy. He knew that he had to have a strict iron hand on Mike, that Mike could never, ever be permitted to call the shots in any way, shape, or form. And with a, a, a very smart trainer, manager like Customato, he knew Kevin would handle it in that way. And that's the way it has to be done with a fighter. You cannot, cannot permit the fighter to make any decisions whatsoever because they're not in that position, whether it's the training decision or business decision, especially the business. Cus knew that Kevin would be sensational as a trainer because he was very hard. And in the three years that I was together with them on the road in New York at the fight, Mike would never, ever talk back to Kevin. Whatever Kevin wanted, that's the way it was going to be. And the same thing with the managers, Jacobs and Caton. Mike would never dream of saying anything that would go against them. As a matter of fact, when he was asked after each fight, who do you want to fight next, Mike would calmly say, hey, I'm just a fighter. Speak to the managers. I don't have anything to do with that. So it was that thinking process that... Mike had, whether it was being deferential to the trainer or deferential to the managers, that's the way he was. The result of that was Mike being the world's most popular athlete and on his way to becoming the most valuable sport personality of all time because every decision Kevin made resulted in something positive and every decision the managers made resulted in something positive. But then again, that all ended in the summer of 88 with uh, Robin and, and Don King. 
And as Tyson started going up in the ranks and started beating stiffer opponents like James Quick Tillis and Jose Ribalta and, and these guys, and then Tyson finally gets a title shot. And what was it like for the Team Tyson camp to hear that they were getting this world title shot, something that everybody knew that he was going to be successful or do very well in, in this fight with Trevor Burbick? Well, it was an interesting time because, you know, Mike was very confident, of course. The interesting word you used was the Tyson camp. It was never a Tyson camp. We, Mike and I and Kevin lived in a place by ourselves. The guy who owned the house slept there, but there was no hangers-on. There were no cronies. There were no sponges. There were no uh, rah-rah guys. That was the last thing Mike wanted. He didn't want anybody like that around. I didn't want it, and Kevin didn't need it. So there was really no camp. It was a, a very tight-knit group of Kevin, Mike, and I. And that's the way Mike liked it. Mike was very confident of the fight. But interestingly enough, I never really asked Mike about what he thought of Trevor Burbick before the fight. But I just had to know in some way. So the day before the fight, we were driving after we got some videotapes. And uh, I figured, let me see if I can get Mike to tell me what he thought of Trevor Burbick. So I, I figured out what I'd do. I said to Mike, Mike, man, uh, what would uh, Cuss say about this guy? And Mike said, uh, what do you mean? I said, Cuss, how would he describe Burbick? What kind of fighter? And Mike thought for a second. He said, uh, he'd probably consider him a tomato can. Now, once I knew <laughs> that that's what Cuss would have said to Mike, or that's what Mike thought Cuss would say, then I knew that's what Mike thought. And that meant that when Mike walked in the ring, he knew that instead of going in there to fight Joe Lewis or Jack Dempsey or Rocky Marciano, he's going in to fight a tomato can. That gives you tremendous confidence when you think like that. And that's the way Mike fought the fight. So that training camp was pretty smooth. Uh, we were out there for four weeks. Uh, Mike's uh, confidence was uh, very high, and he knew that he wasn't fighting Joe Lewis. And his performance in the fight, of course, was, was spectacular. After he won the title, did it get to his head at all? Do you think Tyson changed his attitude and the way he was after winning that, or did he stay the same and humble Mike Tyson as he was, like you're saying, when he was being raised there with you guys in, in the Catskills? Well, let's put it this way. First of all, the answer is no. But if you can find one person on the planet who thought differently, I'd love to meet the person. Now, not what I say, but Mike was living in my apartment at that time. We came back to New York City, and he continued sleeping on the couch for day after day, week after week. Now, you think that a guy who had some type of ego in some way would say to me, Steve, uh, I want the bedroom you sleep on the couch, or I want my own apartment. In the building we lived in had 400 apartments. Everybody in the, in the building adored Mike because he would play with the kids and hang out with the kids, and uh, the moms and dads were always enamored with him. He was the youngest heavyweight champion. Never, ever did he speak, uh, speak out in any way that was improper, ever. Now, if he did, it would have hit the newspaper. It would have hit the advertising column. Somebody would have picked up on it in some way, shape, or form. So while people like to say that, that that's what changed him, there's no evidence whatsoever that that happened. And the critical thing that tells me that's accurate is that sponsors would not have permitted him to sell the product if he had a bad attitude, because that would reflect on the product. The police department of New York would not have hired him in 87 if his attitude was bad, because that would have been a reflection on the police. Same thing with the FBI and DEA. They don't hire guys with attitudes or problems because it's a bad reflection. So to answer your question, he did not change until he got married. Then it was a complete turnaround. He goes on, he fights in Japan against Tony Tubbs, and shortly after that fight, so you guys get the news that Jim Jacobs uh, you know, was ill or that he passed. How was that for your guys' team there or group? Jim passed away in March, and it was very tough on everyone. But Mike had already lost Customato, and it did not affect him in any way, shape, or form. A few days after Cus passed away, we had to go to Houston, Texas, and fight this guy, Eddie Richardson, and Mike put on a sensational performance. Uh, Mike's attitude, his demeanor, his uh, emotional stability would have been fine after Jim passed away because uh, the proof of that was Customato and, and that incident. What changed Mike, his personality and everything at that time, was Bruce Roper and Robin Gibbons. That made Mike very unhappy. 
unhappy. So in my opinion, because there was nothing in evidence that a traumatic situation like that would have made Mike any uh, emotional problems, given Mike any emotional problems, when Jim passed away, there would have been no problem whatsoever for Mike continuing on. He had Kevin, he had me, Camille Ewald, Bill Caton, the, the wives, Lorraine Jacobs and, and uh, uh, Doris Caton, people, friends, newspaper writers, Jose Torres, a huge wealth of good people around him. But what changed him was Robin Gibbons. That was the line in the spring and summer of 88 that tra- changed everything. Jim Jacobs' death would not have changed anything. And everything I've read, and I'm honored to have you here because it feels like I read every book on Mike Tyson. Uh, you know, when I first started watching boxing, I saw so many documentaries. You're always in there because you were a part of the group. From everything I've read, you're kind of changing my mind on a lot of things that, from what I've read anyways, I mean, you firsthand were there, so you'd be the perfect person to come to about this. From what I remember reading or what the tone was from what I've read is that after Jimmy Jacobs passed and Cus being gone, that Bill Caton didn't really have much of a relationship with Mike Tyson, and that left pretty much the doors open for people like Robin or Don to come in and take him away from what he was or what he already became. Would you say that's true, no. that he did not have a relationship with Bill Caton? No, uh, it's inaccurate because what took Mike away was Robin saying she was pregnant when she never was, and knowing that Remember now, there are some people on the planet Earth who are very bad. You know, you might get, you might find people who, who take an extra biscuit off the table when it's not there. But there are other people who cut your throat, take your wallet, and then go have dinner without any remorse whatsoever. And they're called sociopaths. And that was what was Robin. She was a TV actress making a lot of money. But Mike was making serious money, the type of money people kill for. So she told Mike she was pregnant, which she never was to get Mike to marry her, and it worked. But she could never have Bill Caton around because Bill would account for every penny. She could never have Kevin Rooney around because Kevin would tell Mike, where's the money? And she could not have me around because I would tell Mike, what's going on here? Where, where, why aren't you training? Why aren't you happy? What's going on? So she had to sever the relationship between everyone. And to show you how, de- how deceptive she was and to counter what you're saying about Bill Caton, during the Sphinx fight episode, the day before the Sphinx fight, uh, Mike had a friend, a dear friend named Rory Holloway, and he wanted Rory to start up a business with Mike Tyson T-shirts, apparel, hats, and stuff like that. And he told Rory that the guy who knew more about marketing like that than anyone else was Bill Caton. So he went up to Bill's hotel room at the Trump Plaza in Atlantic City. Uh, that's where the Sphinx fight was taking place. And he asked Bill, can you talk to Rory a bit and help him? So he absolutely sat Rory down. Rory, look, this is what we're going to do. When the fight is over, I'll help you design the shirts. I'll help you this. Marketing, going to the uh, uh, companies, Macy's, we'll sell them for about two hours. After the meeting, Mike said to Bill, Bill, this is, I can't thank you enough. And Bill said, Mike, it's my pleasure. Mike said, you know, how do we work with you? Bill said, I don't want any part of that money at all. That's for you and Rory. It's my pleasure to have Rory do that. And Mike said, oh, Bill, I can't thank you enough. And he left. The next night at ringside, on camera, Robin's attorney gives Bill a legal letter saying he sued to break the contract. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Mike Tyson and I knew that was happening, I don't think I'd go up to Bill Caden's room the day before and ask him for a favor. That's how deceptive Robin was. She didn't even tell Mike that she was going to do that with Bill Caden. And obviously, Mike on his own, he went to Bill the day before and said, can you help me? So that shows you what was happening around Mike Tyson at that time. He had no problem with Bill. He knew Bill would look out for every, every penny, which he had, what he was doing. And the, the problem was Robin Gibbon. Another scenario like that to show you what Bill was like, when Mike had a huge problem with Mitch Green, hitting him in the streets in the summer of, of 88, uh, there was a lawsuit the next day Mitch Green wanted to have Mike arrested because of salt, salt and battery. Robin was dealing with Donald Trump and some lawyers. A big, she thought she was going to get all this attention. And Trump's lawyer said, you got to have Mike turn himself in because otherwise they'll come looking for him. Bill Caton said, no way is Mike going to a police station to turn himself in. So 
Bill knew exactly what to do. He called Mitch Green's mother and said, Mrs. Green, is Bill Caton? She said, yes. You understand, the, you know, heard about the problem Mitch and Mike had last night? Yes. The Bill said, I, I'd appreciate it if you consider the following. And she said, what's that? He, he said, if you ask Mitch and persuade Mitch to drop the lawsuit, we'll put Mitch on the undercard of Mike's championship fight. And if he wins two, maybe three, you'll get a chance to fight Mike Tyson for the championship of the world. Boom. Done. Case dismissed. Gone. That's the type of thinking process that Mike liked, that incredibly ingenious thinking process. But the people around Mike at that time, whether it was Robin, her mother, or Don King, did not want that thinking process. But that thinking process was focused on one thing and one thing only, what's best for Mike. The Robin Givens, Ruth Roper, Don King thinking process is what was best for the apocalypse. And that was two completely different things. So getting back to your question of the relationship, it was no problem at all until it was instilled in Mike's mind, you got to break this relationship with Bloody. Knowing that Rory, you know, Tyson's friend Rory, later on would become co-managers with John Horn, would you say that this was set up by Don King or would it be a set up by Robin Gibbons? They were probably doing something behind closed doors to get Tyson away from Bill Caton. Well, it's, an, it's a great question, and here's how unbelievably uh, this would be something like a Hollywood movie. When Robin made her move on Mike, they got married, she wanted to steal all the money. Behind her back, while the, the lawsuit was going on with Bill and her, behind her back, Don King went directly to Mike and said, Mike, here's a promotional agreement. You and me, we're going to work together. Mike, being the good husband, gave the agreement to Robin Gibbons and his wife. Robin, you check it out. I, you know, I don't know the business. You check it. She gave it to her attorney, and they told her, if Mike signs this agreement, Don will be able to steal all the money, and you, Robin Gibbons, won't be in there for the big pie. Like a switch on the wall, she told Mike, don't ever speak to Don King again, because she knew there could only be one thief in the family, and that was would be her. And for that whole summer of 88, from June, July, August, September, up to October, Don King was persona non grata in their huge a mansion in Burnsville in New Jersey until the Robin of the uh, Barbara Walter show where that relationship between Mike and, and uh, Robin broke down. So when you're talking about behind closed doors, there were two closed doors, Robin and Mike, where Robin was trying to get over on Mike and keep everyone else away. Don went there to try to open that door and get in himself. He was shut down. But he got back in in a real big way once the Barbara Walter show took place and Mike and Robin were through. That's when Don opened the door, put Mike in and closed it, and then Mike was history. Wow, and all that over the summer, and it kind of makes you think what Mike's mental state would have been. It seemed like everybody was pulling him in different directions. You know, he either was going to stay with you guys, go with his wife and mother-in-law, or go with Don King, and he must have been, you know, going crazy, plus world champion title on top of him. I mean, you know, I must have drove him crazy. And then you hear that incident, you know, I'm, I know that you know about that, you know, him running his car into a, into a tree or whatever. I mean, do you think that had to do with that mental state that he was going through? He was just breaking down himself? Running into the tree, you mean? Yes, sir. Uh, no, Mike can't drive. <laughs> he just can't drive. For a guy who's the, the, the most exciting fighter in the world, who's the greatest defensive fighter in the world, who knows more about the history of boxing than anyone on the planet, who's got a heart of gold, he can't drive. He's the worst driver in the world. I don't know why. It's just a, 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 maybe a mechanical thing. So when I heard that he was trying to kill himself on a road in Catskill, he was probably trying to drive someplace quickly. The road from the house, from the driveway to the road, is not good. It's a, a circuitous little route there on no pavement, on gravel, on dirt. So when, when I read that he was trying to kill himself, I started laughing. There's no way. I think Mike would have picked a better way, you know, a gun, a jump off the cliff or something. But to hurt himself in a car driving 30 miles an hour, I don't think so. Yeah, and i got to agree with that. Um, I've talked to his uh, chauffeur that came later on, Rudy Gonzalez, and he pretty much told me the same thing. You know, Tyson would have him, having him driving, you know, wherever he needed to go because he couldn't drive. Um 
you brought up about Tyson being a historian and knowing so much about the fights. Did that have to do with him being able or to having access to all of Jimmy's and, and Bill's uh, of videos there in, in big fights? That was uh, part two. Part one, for Mike to want to see that stuff, there had to be something in him that was a, a love or adoration or respect to a high degree of those guys. He got that from Customato. Cus adored the fighters, adored fighters. He did not care for managers. He did not care for promoters. He did not care for matchmakers or spin bucket guys. He adored the fighters. Because of that adoration, Mike, caring a great deal for Cus and wanting to emulate Cus, picked up that adoration for the fighters. Now, Mike was in a perfect position to hear the stories from Cus, who knew the guys, and then get the films from Bill and Jim to actually watch the fight. And at that time, back in the uh, 80s, they had this incredible book called The Ring Record Book. It was like a little encyclopedia. And Mike would study it. His brain is like a mini computer. If he wants to learn something, it goes in and it's locked in there. So because he loved the fighter so much and he loved learning about it, he just absorbed that material. So it was because of cuts with the knowledge and the love of the fighters and Jim and Bill having the fight films. He just became enamored with it. Do you think Mike having to know all everything about the sport and, and loving the sport that much and his interest being 100%, whether it been in the past or, or you know watching these, vi- these videos from the past and studying them and studying fighters that fight like him or have the disadvantages of him being shorter, a shorter heavyweight and all that, and maybe you know observing fighters that were probably in the same predicament of being you know uh, shorter fighters for, for their weights or whatever, do you think that was a big advantage for him having access to all these fights? for his career? Well, you mentioned an interesting thing, which I've heard over and over and over, and I just can't believe that trainers and journalists or promoters even think like that, and that's the fact that Mike was short and he's at a disadvantage. I've never heard that a short football player was at a disadvantage over a taller one. I've never heard that a short baseball player was at a disadvantage over a taller one. Or basketball, or tennis, or golf, or soccer, or hockey, or badminton, any other sport. But interestingly enough, only in boxing and only in the heavyweight division is the theme or thinking from some of these legendary minds that the shorter heavyweight is at a disadvantage. I think it's absolutely insane. What gives a shorter fighter a disadvantage or advantage is one thing and one thing only. It's the same thing for a a taller guy. If you don't move your head, you're going to get hit. Now, does the uh, taller guy have a longer reach? Absolutely. But if the short guy, like a Jack Dempsey or Rocky Marciano or Joe Frazier or Mike Tyson, move in, moving their head, then it's the tall guy that's going to get whacked. And that's what's happened every time when these great shorter guys move in. Cus knew that the shorter fighter had no advantage or disadvantage over the tall guy. It was the guy who doesn't get hit coming in, throwing the big shot. So while the Trainers at that time said Mike was too short, or some of the press said he's too short, and his arms are too short. Cuss knew that having seen Jack Dempsey, having seen Rocky Marciano, Joe Frazier, he knew there was no no such thing as a disadvantage. And that was absolutely true, because when Mike fought, he got hit less going forward than the fighters in history who were tall running backward. So that's a tremendous spotlight on what Cuss taught Mike, and that was head motion. We were talking about how, you know, the rift between, you know, after the and before the, the Spinks fight. At what point did you feel the break, uh, you know, the people you were with Tyson and his new cap? Did you get a call from him? Did you get any kind of official letter or anything where you felt that separation or where everything was broken up? The answer is yes. Uh, but as a, a little uh, introduction to that, when Mike and Robin broke up, after the famous Barbara Walter show, where she claimed he was mag depressive, uh, which he never was. And by the way, that was something else that I hear all the time, that Mike was always mag depressive or emotional. Isn't it interesting that he wasn't that way from 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, but only when he was with Robin Givens. I always think that was fascinating. Uh, that she put him on lithium, you know, a very dangerous drug. Uh, and the Barbara Walter show takes place. They break up after that show. He comes back to the office a day later, to apologize to, to Bill Caton about that whole summer of 88 and acting that way. And Bill said, Mike, forget it. The most important thing is for you to know 
you're not crazy. And Mike said, you mean it? I'm not crazy. Bill Caton brought in the world's most famous psychiatrist right there to the office the following day. Examined Mike. Mike's absolutely fine. He just has to get back to his training regimen. Fighting, he's fine. What, I, what happened then was a huge error on my part. Mike was delighted that he wasn't ill. Bill laid out a, a series of fight plans for him, more commercials. Mike was ecstatic that all this was going to happen and take his mind off of, of Rob and that incident. At that moment, Mike left the office and said, Bill, I'm delighted to be back here. Thank you. My mistake was, I should have told Mike, Mike, I'll wait down by the elevator for two minutes, up right down. And he would have said, fine, I'll wait downstairs. I would have gone back to Bill and said, Bill, I need $100,000 in cash. He'd say, what for? I want to take Mike down to Rio de Janeiro, have him, I don't want to use the word, uh, have him intimate with dozens of women because he's in pain right now. And Bill would have said, but he looks fine to me. I would have said, Bill, this kid is in emotional pain. He just lost the woman of his dream, and he's dying. He may not show it, but he's a professional fighter. He doesn't show you what's inside, but he's dying. My mistake was I didn't do that. Had I brought him down there for three or four weeks, had him meet with a lot of women, it would have taken his mind off Robin Gillen. So to get back to your point, did I know something where he was breaking away? Yes, because two days after the office situation that I just mentioned, Don King grabbed him brought him to Cleveland, and got him the 20, 30 women a day that Mike used or Mike needed or Mike to take Mike's mind off of Robin Gibbon. A week goes by, and Mike calls. He says, I'm just still hanging out here in Cleveland. I'll, I'll be back in a, in a week or so. I said, terrific, great. A week later, he calls, you know, Steve, I've been thinking about my, my career and stuff like that, but I'll, I'll get back to you next week. I said, oh, okay. And then a week later, he calls. He says he wants his uh, uh, contract. He wants copies of his contract. And right then, I knew it was a uh, big, big problem. But that was the power of Don King. He, he knew Mike was hurting, and Mike was in a vulnerable position. And that was the end of Mike Tyson uh, as a hero in boxing at that time. Listening to what you're saying, in a lot of ways, he kind of admitted that, I think, when um, he fought his last fight and they interviewed him at the end of the fight. Um, you know, he said something like that his career was over in 1990, which was his loss to Buster Douglas, which, of course, in my opinion, resulted due to signing with Don King. Um, what do you remember about his next fights after the Spinks fight, being with Don King uh, up until the Buster Douglas fight? What were your opinions of what you saw compared to what you were seeing when he was with you guys? Well, you know, his fight after the Spinks fight was the uh, Bruno fight in, in Las Vegas. I, I wasn't worldly enough to be able to tell where Mike was heading at that point. I just didn't know. If I was Customato, having seen fighters like that taken over by, by the mafia, by thugs, and see their careers end, I would have had a better feeling. I just didn't know. I just cared, I just cared about Mike. Uh, I was sad that he's surrounded by those thugs, you know, the Rory Holloways, the John Horns, and Don King, selling Mike out. That made me unhappy, but I didn't know where he was heading. Uh, when the Douglas fight took place, then I was very, very sad, of course, because of that ending. But as a, a, a touchstone to the way the people around Mike considered him and the way they felt about him and the way they were responsible for him. The fight's over in the ring, the Douglas fight, and Mike has got this huge balloon eye being taken back to the uh, dressing room. Buster Douglas is being interviewed in the ring by the HBO commentators. And standing behind Buster Douglas is Don King smiling. And I saw that for a, a second. It's the camera panned. I saw him smiling. I said, what the heck is this guy smiling? What his, the guy he called his son, Mike Tyson, my son, dear son, is carrying, carry, being carried back to this locker room. So I, don't know, I didn't know if anyone else saw that brief flash of Don King smiling. So I took a, a videotape. I froze it, took a, a picture of the TV set. And said to the press, I said, why is Don King smiling when Mike is being carried back to the dressing room? And he put a newspaper in New York while he knocked his rabbit in the, in the, in the, in the newspaper. And uh, that was a touchstone to what made me really sad. But this is the type of people around Mike. They couldn't care less for Mike as a person. Only what is he making? How much is he making? Who's making the money? And Rory, and Hall Rory Holloway and John Ward were perfect. Uh, 
tag men for Don to keep around Mike so they could keep other people away. And it worked for fight after fight after fight. But if, there were, if Rory Holloway was a real friend, instead of taking the money from Don King, he should have gone to Mike and said, Look, Mike, I, you know, I, I like making a, a half a million bucks a fight, but this is no good for you, man. You've got to get your own lawyer. You got Don't go back to Bill Caton or Steve Ross, but get your own lawyer. Get your own accountant. Get people like that. He didn't do that. He took the money. You know, and that's, that was the end of Mike Tyson. When you have friends, the, the expression is, when you have friends like Rory Holloway and John Horn, you don't need enemies because they're your enemies right off the bat. And you bring up that little video you're talking about or that, that frame you're talking about with Don King spying in the back. I don't remember seeing that. But thinking back, I remember uh, Don King made a big stink about the Douglas knockdown where he, he was knocked down and supposedly there was a long count to that. And that, you know, it was like 14 seconds he was down, you know, kind of like the, you know, Jack Dempsey, Gene Tunney type thing. But, you know, I, I didn't I didn't catch that Don King there in the background smiling, but I do remember he tried to overturn the, the judgment there. Yes, and I'm glad you brought that up. I had forgotten something at that press conference uh, after the fight where, you know, Don was crying about the, the, the long count, so to speak. Uh, two things. Number one, Mike did not bust the Douglas down. It was a tremendous knockdown. And Douglas is on the canvas. is round eight. And the referee's counting, you know, one, two, three. Now, Douglas should have stayed on the canvas and been counted out. And the fight would have been over, and the press would have said, Mike, it was a tough fight, but you won by, by a knockout for exhalation. He counted five, six, seven. And the fight should have been over, and the press would have said, Mike, tough fight, you won for Eight, nine, nine and three quarters, 9.999. What made Douglas get up? I remember him pounding the canvas, Douglas. What made him get up at 9.9999 and fight? And then two rounds later, knock Mike out. Well, it has to do with the powers that be looking down at that time and saying, Mike, uh, you made some errors. And when you were with good people, nothing was going to go wrong, nothing. But now you're with bad people and nothing's going to go right. So the fight's over. Getting back to what you mentioned about Don King crying about the uh, long count. Uh, they were at the press conference. After the press conference, there was a news writer who described the incident with the press conference and Don King. And uh, his name was Pete Dexter of the Sacramento Bee newspaper. I'll never forget it. He was talking about the press conference and Mike Tyson. And he writes, and there sits next to Mike Tyson one Don King who puts the girls on the street and the boys in the ring. The best can be described as disease. Now, I don't know about you. But when the press writes something about one of my associates, in that way, something's wrong. And that's the way most of the press wrote about Don King. When he was inducted into the Hall of Fame in Canister, New York, the press went, uh, are you kidding or what? So that was a touchstone to what was happening around Mike Tyson. And at the Douglas fight, even though it was a tough fight for Mike, he, could he have won? Yes. But it didn't happen. But Don was crying about it. And the press accurately describe what Don King was. That's not the type of people you want around a fighter like that. A few years later, Tyson's career and, and life just you know went downward even faster. Um, he gets in that whole thing with the Desiree Washington rape thing. From the evidence or from what you've heard, obviously you or I weren't there. And no, nobody was in that room except Tyson and Washington. But from what you've heard or what, from what you know, do you think that he did do something like that and he was uh, guilty of... Well, number one, Mike lived in my apartment for three years. I would go to work during the day, and he'd wake up probably about 10 o'clock after, you know, when there's no training. Uh, he'd go out and he'd wake up at 10 and invite women over during the day. It isn't it interesting that for three years, with women in and out of the apartment all day, there was never a problem. And we lived in, as I said, in a building with 400 apartments. No one ever complained. No one ever called the building. We lived one block from the Daily News, the biggest newspaper in the world at that time. No one was ever notified there. Nobody pressed, no police for three years. So to answer your question, the Mike Tyson that I know could never do something like that. The problem was that there were two things that happened out there which gave the, the jury the reason to say he's guilty. The first was what Mike's testimony was. His lawyer, a Don King crony, had Mike testify in his own behalf. And what Mike said was that this girl should have known I'm a rough guy because I do this to all the women I see, all the women I hang out with. 
Now, in New York and Chicago and Philadelphia, big cities where the juries are hip people and from from a you know a cosmopolitan area, they probably would have, they could have probably said, hey, you know, this girl, you know, she should have known, and you know, there's no, it's really not a guilty verdict, especially in Indiana, because in that case, the Desiree Washington deposition was incredible. Her own deposition was where she said she went up to his room at 2 o'clock in the morning. She went into the bathroom and took off her penny shield. She went out and sat on his bed. Now, if I was Mike Tyson's lawyer, I would have her on the stand before Mike ever got on the stand and said, Miss Washington, this is your deposition. You went up there at 2 o'clock in the morning. She said, yes, I did. You went into the bathroom and took off your penny shield at 2 o'clock in the morning. You said, yes, I did. And your deposition here says that you went out to Mike's room and you sat on the bed without your panty shield at 2 o'clock in the morning. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Mike's lawyer should have said to the jury, ladies and gentlemen, we rest our case. That's it. The jury would have gone back and said, gee, there's no evidence. It's her word against his word. But her action, there's some doubt here about what her intentions were. That's what a real lawyer would have done. That's what a Bill Caton lawyer would have done. But Don King's lawyer, a Washington, D.C. business guy, was out of place there. That was the first huge error that happened that resulted in the uh, conviction. The other thing was Mike's history at that time. His demeanor had changed in the public eye. And because of the cronies around Don and, and Mike, Mike started slowly uh, gravitating back toward a street mentality. And that mentality caused him to say things that were improper in the press, actions improper, the knockout with Douglas and all of the uh, different change in his demeanor, the jury, recognizing all that, it gave them more ammunition to think that he was guilty, as opposed to being in 85, 86, 87. If anything like that happened, gee, why would this happen? It's so out of whack. Mike's never acted in this fashion before, in, in an improper fashion. But at that time, in 1992, it was different. Do I think he did it? No. But the people around Mike was horribly, poorly handled a trial for, for Mike, and that's what put him away. That attorney, Don King's attorney there, he was more of a tax attorney, right? I mean, he was he was more of a, that was more what his specialty was, and now he's doing a rape case, and like you said, he was painting to the jury that this was a horrible guy that did all these acts, and, you know, it, I think it ultimately, you know, costed him that, that case, and, uh, you know, or else I don't think he would have been there in the first place. Well, the, you know, the lawyer was a tax guy, business guy named Vincent Fuller from uh, Washington. He was a Don King attorney, which probably meant that Don probably had some business dealings with him behind the scenes. You know, Mike's uh, the legal fees that Mike was going to be charged. Don, I'm sure, participated in that with the attorney. The things done behind the scenes, you know, so when Mike finally sued Don, eventually, and they went to the books and Don was charging Mike a $1,000 a day for laundry service, you know, things like that. Uh, so, but you're correct. There was an attorney that was out of place. Every decision at that time, as I said, was made for Mike, and it resulted in something negative, every single one. And unfortunately, that was a horrible decision. And, you know, I visited Mike three times out there in Indiana, and it's a pretty sad place. He handled it really well. You know, it's not easy to be in jail for three years. You know, that was a very sad place to go, and, uh, you know, he got out and he handled it. Whether it be Tyson or Cameron Rooney or any of these guys you used to work with back then, do you still talk to or are you still cordial with any and all of them? Oh, sure. Uh, Mike and I are very friendly. Uh, his wife is sensational. I live in Las Vegas, and Mike lives about 10 miles away in a city called Henderson, right outside Las Vegas. And I've been working with them on a, on a, a number of different projects. Uh, they've been sensational with me. And uh, Kiki, his wife, is, is a brilliant woman. She's guiding him. She's dumped all of the bad people around Mike. And the reason he's in the public eye now in a positive way is because of that thinking process. What's best for Mike? Not what's best for anyone in the public eye, not for the, the old cronies, not for the press, not for anybody else, but what's best for Mike. And every, so far, the decisions have been perfect. So the answer is yes, I, I have spoken to Mike. Uh, Kevin, I speak to. He's still in Catskill. Uh, he's hoping for a young kid to get there, like a young Mike Tyson, where he can work with them up in, in Catskill. Uh, that's going to be tough because the town is very quiet. And I think gone are the days where a kid is going to move to a town like that just to train. They 
rather be in a big city where you're around a lot of people. So the answer is, yeah, I can speak to both Kevin and, and Mike. And after his prison release, he went on with, with his career for several years after that. What did you think of that, Mike Tyson? Was that a, a good thing for him, or do you see that as, as a black eye for him and his career? Well, the two parts are uh, physically, you know, in the ring action, he, he won fights, and he became champion again, beating, beating Bruno. Uh, the problem is that emotionally, uh, Mike, you know, he's not stupid. He's very smart. When the second Holyfield fight took place, people think incorrectly that Mike bit Van de Zier because of, uh, uh, you know, they were headbutting or he was, you know, whatever was happening. It had nothing to do with that whatsoever. It had to do with the fact that Mike is very smart. When the fight took place, he's thinking, I'm with Don King, Glory Holloway, John Horn, they're stealing all my money. Don King's lawyer got me put away. I can't say anything about that because it'll make me, it'll be embarrassing for me now to say stuff like that. I was with Bill Cate and Jim Jacobs. I was a hero doing commercials on TV. White people loved me. Green people loved me. Black people loved me. I was the world's most popular athlete, voted by the Associated Press, police department ads, fire department, FBI. Now here I am in 1997 with Don King going into a fight with Amanda Holyfield where he knocked me out the first time. White people disliked me. Black people disliked me. The press disliked me. I was in prison for three years for something I didn't do. Now he's in the fight, and, you know, he's getting more emotional and more emotional. He goes back to the corner after round one. You don't see this in him, and you don't know this, but in his brain, he's thinking, what the hell am I doing here? I got all these jerk-offs around me. And this guy, Evander's a tough guy. I wish I had Kevin Rooney here. I should have never dumped him. Where's my money? Where's my bank account? Same thing in the end of round two. Round three. He's fighting the guy. There's pressure. You can hear yelling from the stands. You, you know, you Mike Tyson with, he broke. He broke. In the same way, if you're in your office and you're under pressure with a report, having to do a report, as uh, one of your associates comes in and says to you, uh, hey, hey, do you have that uh, letter? And you look up the guy, hey, don't you see I'm working on this? Uh, Joe, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to blow up with you, but I just got so much pressure to get this report done. And Joe says, hey, no problem. I'm sorry. You go and do your thing. That's exactly what happened with Mike. The difference is the pressure on Mike was a trillion times greater than someone in their office having to do a report. The whole world looked at him in a negative way. You know, the guy in the office, the analogy I made about the office, the guy who was yelling, when he left the office, no one knew he said something improper to the associate. Only he knew. What Mike did for year to year to year, the whole world knew. Everyone recognized him everywhere he went. So wherever he would go, after the rape, after the conviction, after all that stuff, the demeanor and everything else like that, people would recognize him. Hey, Mike, uh, you know, with that rape conviction, hey, Mike, when you dumped Kevin Ring over and over, that was very difficult for him to take. And that's the reason why he got into that answer with, with the band. It had nothing to do with the band. Or punching him or headbutting him, it had to do with the pressure of, this whole life coming down. Having said all that, now the million dollar question that I'm sure you get asked all the time, should he have not broken ties with Bill Caton after the Sphinx fight, what would have happened or what would have became of Mike Tyson should he have stayed the Mike Tyson of old that we all remembered and loved? Well, you know, I was too young uh, and inexperienced to have that vision, but uh, the Cuffs had a fighter, Jose Torres, who was very close with Mike. They were very close. And I was talking to Jose one time, and I said, you know, Mike is you know, getting pretty big, you know, 87 now after the Tucker fight, the big fight, and now coming up to Holmes. And uh, Jose said to me, Steve, you know, I've been around, and I'm telling you right now, Mike's going to be huge. If he keeps going, he's going to be huge. And I've seen what Ali was, and I've seen what Joe Frazier was. He's going to be bigger because of his fighting style. And if he keeps his head on straight, as Cuss always hoped he would, without distraction, he's going to be huge. And I think that would have happened. As a matter of fact, there's a writer for ESPN uh, Sports named Brian Campbell, who about six months ago did a column where recognizing that Mike is coming back a little bit in the public eye more and more and more, he wrote that if Mike continues in this fashion, he can become the Muhammad Ali of this era, becoming loved and adored. And that's not impossible. But that would have happened 
25 years ago with Mike, but it was sidetracked with all that stuff. It was also interesting that when he left us, it was just the beginning of the pay-per-view era, just the beginning. So uh, he, the money he would have made would have been enormous. But more important to him was the way he was perceived in the public eye. He, he loves being adored. I mean, who doesn't? You know, people coming up to you and saying, we love you, you're sensational. I want my five-year-old son to grow up and be like you. That was gone from his life for that 20-year period. And that's true. I mean, he's coming out in movies now, and he's doing that stand-up thing with, uh, I think it was produced by Spike Lee, I want to say. And he's doing you know a lot of things there on the side. And he's getting back into the spotlight. And I think in a positive way, I haven't seen anything negative written about him. I think everything he's been touching so thus far is a success. So uh, that's good to hear. Um, you worked for Big Fights, Inc. Uh, for several years or several decades. What is that like working with all these historical films that people you know like me would just die to even take a glance at? Well, it was a lot of fun because it was a great job watching all day, watching Ali, Lewis, Dempsey, Marciano, Ray Robinson. It was good news and, strangely enough, somewhat difficult because today I find it very difficult to watch live boxing. Uh, it's just very difficult. Uh, unless a fight is super, super big like last night, I've been spoiled a little bit, you know, and uh, watching those great fighters from the past. And interestingly enough, uh, I met Jimmy Brown, the great football player, uh, about 25, almost 30 years ago. He came to the office he, uh, in New York, the fight film office. Uh, he was the advisor for George Foreman. They came to look at early George Foreman fights because uh, Jimmy Brown was uh, George's advisor. And my boss at the time, Jimmy Jacobs, the world's handball champion, was showing them the films of George's early fights. And after it was showing... Jim Jacobs asked Jimmy Brown, you probably have films of your early football career that you like to watch, like Foreman just watched fights of, uh, of his early career. And Jimmy Brown said, no. And Jimmy Jacobs was the world champion in handball. He said, well, I have films of myself playing handball. Every great athlete likes to you know, have memories like that. Don't you have that? And Jimmy Brown said, no, I don't. And Jacobs said, well, why not? And Jimmy Brown said, because I don't like to live in the past. And, you know, I was national champion at that time, junior national champion. And uh, when, when he said that, I went home, took all my trophies and dumped them. I said, if he, he's considered the greatest athlete of all time, Jimmy Brown, by many organizations. And uh, if he can say that, then what the hell am I holding up to some trophies for? So getting back to great fight films, I apologize. I still live in the past. I still, those fighters are sensational. And I'm going to bring them back to the public eye. Uh, we've just finished a deal for a new boxing hall of fame in Las Vegas. It's, uh, the construction is almost complete. It's at a huge sports facility called SCORE, S-C-O-R-E. They've made the, the uh, developers of this exhibit made deals with every Hall of Fame, football, basketball, hockey, Heisman Trophy, for them to put exhibits under this one roof. Uh, the company I work with owns all the fight films in the world for Halls of Fame and museums, a subsidiary of ESPN. So this new Boxing Hall of Fame is going to go in this uh, facility. People will walk through and see. Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays in the baseball air, uh, exhibits. And, and they get the football. They'll see Jimmy Brown and Bart Starr and great football players. And then they get to the basketball exhibit. They'll see Oscar Robertson and Bob Cousy and great. And then when they get to boxing, they may not have known or remembered these fighters, but they're going to see Lewis Dempsey, Marshall, and Ray Robinson. And the one thing we have that the other exhibits don't are the fight films. Make, um, a football Hall of Fame does not own any of their uh, football films. It's NFL films owns the film. Uh, the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame, Cooperstown, they own no films. It's Major League Baseball. Same with hockey and all the other sports. This is the only exhibit that owns its own film. And that's what's going to separate it when people come in and they see Dempsey dropping these guys and Lewis dropping these guys and Frazier and Robinson. They're going to say, holy mackerel, these great fighters, they're, they're right up there with loose with Ruth and Gehrig and you know, Robinson and you know Bob Cousy, they're right there with those other athletes, and that's what I want them to see. Oh, you got to keep me updated on that. Um, yes. Do you still have rights to or make DVDs if you wanted of some of these old fights or make documentaries or have documentaries made of some of these fights? I know me being a, a Latino especially here in Southern California where there's a lot of Mexican crowd that are hardcore Mexican fans uh, of boxing. 
I know there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of education or knowledge of the past of boxing. They kind of go by uh, what what is done right now. I know there's a lot of fight films out there that are lost with Mexican fighters or Latino fighters. Is that something that you would be able to do if you really wanted to? Sure. Um, the license we have permits us to make uh, DVDs of any of those fights of the, that era. Uh, our license runs up to like the early 80s, meaning most recent fights we do not have rights to, but we have rights to, for example, Latinos, whether it's Kid Galvan from, from Cuba or Manuel Ortiz from Mexico or Ruben Olivares from Mexico or Carlos Ortiz from Puerto Rico and Carlos Manzan from Argentina. We have those films, and they are sensational, sensational fighters. I don't know if the younger people, the Hispanic people today, would know who those uh, fighters are. Their parents would, for sure, because those fighters are revered in the public eye. Absolutely. To answer your question, yes, we can make those DVDs and sell them. Wow, that is awesome. I mean, every time I think of these old fight films, I know years back when I was younger and I first started watching boxing, um, I went to this, I think, video store that was closing down, and I guess they had a large a library of sports videos, and they were selling everything on clearance. I bought a whole bunch of different boxing ones that I saw. I think a lot of them were produced by big fights. Um, and I remember just watching them religiously. And, and to this day, I still, you know, read about these boxers, especially now with the Internet and all that. You know, you could read about these boxers and kind of educate yourself. And, and that's what I call it, is education. Whenever I read about boxing or history, that's pretty much what it is, education. And that's why I would love to read or know that something like that would be made. And that, that's great to know or hear that, you know, it could be done. Yes, it can, and it will be, too. Well, Steve, thank you very much for coming on to theboxingbar.com. I took a lot more of the time that I thought I'd, I'd have on here with you, but thank you very much for being patient and doing this. And hopefully down the line, you know, maybe you could, you could come back on and instead of talking about just Tyson or whatever, we could come back and talk about boxing in general, bring up all these fighters like Dempsey, like Lewis, like Marciano, like Jack, Dem Jack Johnson, everybody else. Thank you very much, Steve, for doing this. Thank you for your time and hope to talk to you one day down the line, amigo. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much.